Well, Mark, you're on Night Dreams Talk Radio After Dark. This is Gary. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and thank you very much for having me. Well, yeah. Well, whereabouts are you at, located at? I am just north of Seattle, Washington, on a little island called Whidbey, W-H-I-D-B-E-Y. I know it well. My grandfather and my grandmother lived there for many years. There used to be a lady that lived there, Mrs. Pongreen, that uh, was actually at one time the richest woman on Whidbey Island. She had a huge farm. Really? Yeah, I grew up around Langley. Actually, one of my cousins actually owned the liquor store in oh, Langley. I'll be darned. Uh, yeah, my, my zip code is actually Langley, 98260. Now, in Langley, yeah. on the opposite side of the, the main street, Yeah. Now you go by the fairgrounds, correct? Yep. And now heading towards the little town. Yeah. And on the right side of it, there's the water. And then you have the left side, which all the businesses are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Back in the forties, after World War II, my dad bought a house with my mom and it was right there. It, it, it was right there by Langley. And it was, you know, like a couple hundred feet away from the water. Yeah. That's the neat. Last, Small the world. Last, well, the funny thing is, the last time I was over on Whidbey Island, which has now been maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. That house is long gone. Oh. Where the house was, where it had a couple hundred feet before you could see the water. Yeah. Well, you could just walk where roughly where the house should have been. And there's the water, you know, down the bank. Sure. A lot of erosion in that area. Yeah, there can be uncertain. I mean, it is an island after all. So yeah, there is a little bit of erosion from time to time. Yeah, they still have the fair there. Oh yeah, yep, the Island County Fair. I haven't been in years. It's something you know when you live here or when you grow up here, you go as a kid. But I haven't been in a long time. Oh yeah, I I grew up you know on Woodby Island. I spend the summers there. Oh, loved it. So you you know it's really grown up though, hasn't it? I mean, it's not like it was. 30, 40 years ago, I can say No, that. no, it's not. And of course, the, the you know, all the area around it on the other side, you know, Everett and Seattle and Linwood and all the, that's really, really beefed up. The, the south end of the island is, it still isn't that bad. It's not, not as much as change as you might think when you, next time you swing by. Yeah. One of my other relatives had a farm there and it was, it was so beautiful there. You know, it's just way, you know, it's just like times past. I need to get back up there and check it out. Yeah. Now you, why don't you tell the listeners uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, let's see. Well, I grew up here and then I moved out to Colorado and played video games for a living to start my career back in the, um, the early 90s. And then I taught proprietary software for the better part of 20 years out in Boulder, Colorado, and did that for, you know, all the way up until about 2015. And that's when I started digging into this whole flat earth thing and uh, around 2014, summer of 2014, and then 2015, I made a video series called Flat Earth Clues, put it out in the internet and said, you know what? Can't prove it's globe anymore. Here's why. Fired it off there, thought that uh, I would get shot down and I could go back to sleep. But instead, uh, this snowball just started rolling to where now we have conferences and I get to travel all over the place and, and do speaking things. And I've got two books out and uh, did a commercial last year in Melbourne, Australia, of all things. And uh, so, yeah, this, this is what I do now full time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, again, I had a friend that used to be with the DOD. Yeah. And he insisted to me the world is flat. It is not round. And he Really? That he, that's what he claimed. And actually, he had me on the line one time when he was calling up NASA asking, is there any way you can send me a video of the Earth rotating? Mm. And NASA, whoever he talked to, I, maybe they were laughing at him, you know, without him knowing it. Yeah. They said, you don't have anything. No, you, there, there isn't. And we, we asked as well, uh, our, several people in our group, there was, um, there was a, a video that was out that they put out in 1990 by the um, satellite Galileo, which supposedly showed it, but they weren't going to say that that was official because the, the weather didn't morph. It was like full 24 hours, but the, the, the clouds didn't change. 
And when you call up, because Hollywood calls up from time to time. In fact, we had a guy pose as a Hollywood producer and called up NASA. It's like, hey, can we get a stock, some stock footage of the Earth rotating? And, you know, from a distance. And they said, sorry, we don't have anything. And that was back in 2017. It's like, what are you talking about? You don't have anything. <laughs> You've had a space program for half a century. Wait, why don't why don't you have anything? So yeah, I've got tons of tons of subject matter experts that I've talked to over the last five years. Nobody from aerospace, nobody from the DoD, but they've all said the same thing. You know, and we're talking pilots and air traffic controllers and engineers and um, you name it. They're they're out, all branches of the military. And they all say the same thing. It's like, you know what? This idea isn't that crazy. And the idea, just so you know, just for your listeners, is that you're not on this tiny little rock flying through space, you know, in, in multiple directions and multiple speeds. And your life isn't some little accident that could be snuffed out at any given point. You're living in a building, you know, with walls and a floor and a ceiling. It's a structure. And that you're, you know, you aren't an accident. You were built by a higher power. Um, you know, I'm not going to name God in this case. Everyone's got their own beliefs, you know, and but that's that's really what we're saying here. And all, everything that we point at shows it. So there's, that's my short stance. Well, I, be, I have seen some pictures from the space station and you can see the curvature of the Earth. You don't see it rotating. Right. But I mean, you, you see the, the you know, the world being somewhat round oh yeah 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 yeah. but at the same time you gotta remember where it's coming from who outside of the military has ever been up there most people don't even realize you know nasa is an is a branch of the military plain and simple they are part of the dod uh you know granted they wear white outfits and they smile for the camera and they don't carry guns but they are absolutely uniquely military founded on the still burning embers of the nazi war machine you know Werner von braun um, so when they show you, yeah. And, and so, yes, I'm saying that every shot that you're seeing up there, everything going from Mercury, Gemini and Apollo and the space shuttle and Soyuz and all that, um, is absolutely faked, uh, because for one big reason, they don't want the public to know until they're ready to tell them. And so they show, but it's interesting because they only show these low earth orbit shots, you know, most of you know, the, the space program, Apollo shut down in 1972 and no other country has ever been to the moon. How, how is that even possible? You know, there's there's at least, uh, what, a dozen different space agencies out there, six supposedly that have launch capabilities, and nobody's gone to the moon. You know, the Russia, we were in a space race and Russia just gave up. China never went, Europe never went, India never went, N nobody's going. And, um, you know, the, the recommitment back to the moon, they said... Uh, Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go in twenty what twenty twenty two twenty twenty four, and they just you know news and we know it wasn't gonna happen. You know the the news story just came out last week. Oh no, we're pushing it out to twenty twenty eight. They they just kick the can down so so far now that there's two generations of people. There's two generations that out there that since Apollo. How is that even possible? There's kids growing up that I mean it's ancient history literally. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So what do you what do you why do you think they're not omitting it or, or what it, what it was their purpose why then? why even bother yeah why hide it um the, the answer is it's it's more simple than you might think in that let's say what i'm saying here is that even our best and brightest didn't figure this thing out until about almost 1960 meaning because we didn't even have the technology to scope the whole thing out until about 1960 you know the internal combustion engine is about the turn of the century uh nasa wasn't even founded until 1958 and then, um, but we still had ballistic missile capability and we were using those from, you know, 1958 to 1962, we were firing atomic weapons straight up. So let's say you find out, let's say, you know, you're, you're the president of the United States or whoever, you know, some high ranking military official, you find out in 1960, it's like, holy smokes, we're actually living in a snow globe, some sort of terrarium, planetarium, Truman show type thing. Do you tell the public? Well... It's a nice idea, maybe, but how does that benefit you in any way to tell them? Because there is a small percentage, you know, that the people might panic, you know, like what they did with Roswell in 1947. And, you know, they, it's possible people could be walking through the streets with pitchforks and torches. So, and think, think about the, like academically what might happen, you know, astrophysics and astronomy would have to shut down in every university in every country. And then all the physical sciences, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, those have to be rebuilt from the ground up. That's just academics. Economically, you'd have to suspend world trading for several months 
until you uh, figured out what it meant to the world markets. And then, of course, the big one is um, this, the religious angle, which is, you know, the, the five major religious houses of this world, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, they all now have leverage against science. And you're asking them to show restraint. You're telling them, oh, yeah, by the way, don't, don't seek revenge <laughs> out against the people that have been beating you over the head with textbooks for the last, oh, I don't know, 500 years. Well, that's a short meeting. It's like, yeah, we probably shouldn't tell anyone yet until we can figure this whole thing out and exactly how, you know, how it would benefit us in the end. And so you build an inf infrastructure and now now we've got it. Now you've got um, high speed Internet, social media, six billion smartphones. Everything's ready, which is why, uh, you know, this is I mean, I'm not doing this. You know, this is not a solo project. It's a big community out there and it just keeps growing and no one's stopping us. I think it's being allowed to happen by the, the same people that hit it in the first place. So what do you think is actually going on? Uh, are we inside of a spear? Are we... Uh, no, you know, no, I think I think we're inside a, um, a box, a, a building, literally no different than a, than a Hollywood soundstage. Uh, again, with walls and a floor and a ceiling. I mean, it, technically, I you know, yes, you could say it was a snow globe because you know we we all love that envisionments of the dome over the top. But outside of that, it's probably a box. You know, a, you know, a, a giant building. Uh, who was it built by? Well, yeah, me. I mean, see, it's one of two things. It's either a higher power that's or a higher um, civilization that's much older and much more powerful than ourselves, or the divine. You can only go one of two ways, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we're we're in a building. We always have been in a building. We're not in space. There is no space. We're probably on somebody's desk. You know, somebody's <laughs> somebody's coffee table for all I know. I mean, but it's it's definitely not. You know, Carl Sagan said it best. He he said, you know, it's interesting because space. He goes he goes. It seems a lot of wasted resources. You know, because 99.999 percent of space is literally just nothing, not even molecules if you believe what mainstream science says about space. So it seems very, very inefficient. The flat earth model, which is basically, you know, a giant snow globe terrarium, is very, very efficient. And it's much more intimate. The stars and the sun and the moon are all on the inside. And basically, uh, you know, to, to quote William Shakespeare, all the world's a stage. You're on it. Well, maybe we're like that one scene from a Twilight Zone where the aliens captured this one little town. Yeah. And, and took it and gave it to his daughter, and they were, they were her pet. Oh, you remember that one? That's very good. Not a lot of people remember that episode. That was a really, and they, there was another, there's been several movies like that over the years. Um, one of the more recent one was from 1998 was Dark City, which was along those lines. Uh, but yeah, who would know? I mean, all you have to remember, there's a line from The Truman Show, which still resonates to me with, with me to this day, which is, People believe the world that is presented to them. You know, we're you're you're told this. I mean, there's a reason why, and I hate you know I hate to break it to people out there. It's like, why do you think it's a globe? In fact, here let me give you a quote real quick. Um, there's a George Orwell quote. You know, George Orwell, the guy that wrote 1984 way back when, and he published something in a newspaper uh, back in 1940, uh, 1946, where he said. He goes, it's interesting. He goes, you go out to anybody in the street and you ask them how they know it's a globe. Their first response is always the same, which is what are you talking about? We know. It is known. It's a, it's a given. And then if you press them on it, you say, yeah, but how do you know? They start getting irritated because they all of a sudden realize that they don't know. It's just oh. something they've been told. Because you got to remember, in 1946. Now, you know what happens. What? And I find it quite often that we talk weird things on the show we talk about the government or we talk about conspiracies strange things happen weird like you just dropped out like you weren't there and then as i hit the disconnect on the computer there you were but it was already being disconnected huh because i could i could hear you the entire time wow uh, but that's all right Maybe. anyway so i i left off probably with george orwell yeah. Uh -huh. huh? Okay, so yeah, George Orwell basically said, how did everybody in the world know it was a globe in 1946? NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. So how did every how did how does everybody know it's a globe? It's not that you know it's a globe. You've never been up there. You've never seen it from a distance. You were just told it was a globe. You were shown that toy in your classroom when you were 6 years old and it stayed with you at least until you graduated from high school. 
And if you've made it to university, it got worse from there. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's where we start, where, where I ask everybody. It's like, how do you know you're on a globe right now? How, how, how in fact, I, what I try to do is like, prove it. Prove to me it's a globe without using NASA as a reference. And you say, well, because you, you got to throw them out. And it's like, why do you throw them out? It's like, well, NASA didn't invent the globe. It's not like they, you know, because the first picture they took of it was in 1972. So if, if NASA is kind of out of the equation, how do you know? Well, there's only two arguments that people even use for, for a globe. So boats going over the horizon and the sticks and shadows argument, which is geometry and most people don't understand that anyway. But let's go with boats going over the horizon, right? No, that's like, well, we see the boat going, 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 going. It's gone. It's gone over the curve. And uh, 10 years ago, I would not yeah, absolutely, right there with you. But HD technology changed that. HD, HD cameras now have the resolution that that boat's gone. You can zoom back in on the horizon. That boat's back in frame. And you can let it go again. And you can zoom and zoom and zoom until, you know, the only thing that's stopping you from looking at it almost forever is the thickness of the atmosphere itself. We can see boats out at 50 miles easily. And that's way beyond the curvature. I've talked to military guys. It's like, oh yeah, we're going, you know, ship to ship with direct beam radar. There's no way we should be able to do that if there's a curvature of the earth. It's just something we've overlooked. Well, how about when I've been on air, uh, air, you know, flights? Yeah. And I could see the curvature of the earth. Oh, could you? I'll put the same challenge out to you that I've given everyone for five years, which is... Okay. I want to know. Well, if you th if you've seen the curvature, take a picture of it. And then put it on your laptop. Before you send it to me, put a straight edge up to it. Tell me if you still see the curvature. I've never gotten a picture in five years. And I have gotten thousands and thousands of emails. The reason is it's it's kind of Orwellian, which is it's not that you see the curve. Because not only have I seen people or, or had people say that they've seen it from an airplane. I've said they've said, said seen it from a mountaintop and even a beach. Amazing amount of people say they see the curve from the beach. I go, really? It's not that you see the curve. You want to see the curve. And that's a big, big difference. Uh, again, take take a picture of it. It's not there. In fact, Neil Tyson, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the world's most popular scientist, he's gone on record television multiple times because, you know, the, the Red Bull jump, you know, some years ago where Felix Baumgartner jumped out of that capsule at 120,000 feet and it showed this severe curvature. And Neil says, no, no, no civilian will ever see the curvature. You can't get up high enough to see the curvature. So if you can't see the curvature from 130,000 feet, you certainly can't see it from a civilian airliner, which caps out at less than 40 usually. I mean, you can go up to 50, but 40 is usually a thing. It's weird. And, uh, and, and trust me, I have, I've heard that from many, many people. It's like, no, I can see it from an airplane. Fine. Show it to me. It's not that you see it. You want to see it. It's weird. I've, I've done the same thing. You want to see the curvature because you've been told this your whole life. Well, how about the people who claim we're not even physically alive we're nothing more than well we're a program right? oh the, sim the simulation theory oh no no i i i have no problem with the simulation theory i mean i grew up in the tech field i know what we've been trying to do in the entertainment industry for years and you know for for those people who are new to that uh we're talking about the matrix trilogy from the early 90s um the 13th floor i'm sorry the late 90s uh, 13th floor from the late 90s and and other simulation movies which is you know could we be digital could we be part of a computer program absolutely we could um the only reason i start with flat earth in fact in the in the last chapter of my book i go into that because if it's flat and it's enclosed it's probably digital and but the thing is most people don't understand it the matrix you know is 21 years old now and a lot of people still don't get it you know computer technology i mean yeah we have smartphones we have all this tech we use it but most you know most of us including me you know don't know how mo most of it works i only learned learned how to microwave work like five years ago you know technically you know looked at the the, the specs on it but yeah it absolutely could be a, a simulation no question no question at all but the again Mo the, most of us out there, you know, the simulation, it doesn't resonate as much as Flat Earth. Flat Earth is way more polarizing, but yeah. Well, if we're living in a box or a big building or whatever, it has to be really huge. Oh, God, yeah. It'd be, it'd be 20,000 miles wide, but not as high as you might think. That's the big, that's the big difference here is that, 
you can remember most of our civilization lives in a very very narrow band you know our you know human beings not only are we limited in temperature you know our uh, we do not like you know room temperature there's a reason why we call it that because that's what temperature we would like the room at but we also most of us live from sea level only about to a mile up from zero to five thousand feet that's 99 percent of our population at 7,000 feet, altitude sickness starts kicking in. So this thing, and you know, commercial airliners cap out at about 10 miles. Uh, spy planes, if you believe what the Air Force tells you, maybe 20 miles. So even if you had a giant building that was 100 miles high, that's nothing. I mean, you know, 20,000 miles wide and only 100 miles high, that's really, it's, a, it's like a shallow sports stadium. That's all you'd need. Okay, now... Uh, we need to take a break. We'll be back in two and a half minutes. So, you know, if you want to get a cup of java or something, we'll be back talking about the flat earth. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Get yourself a cup of java and find a comfy, easy chair. And get ready for Gary and his guest on Night Dreams Talk Radio after dark. And now... Here's Gary. And here I am. And, well, we our guest tonight is Mark Sargent. We're talking about Flat Earth. Mark, are you still with us? I am still with you. Well, I mean, do you have a website on Flat Earth or what you're, you know, you're trying to project out here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the easiest way to find my stuff, I mean, where the bulk of it is, is just on YouTube. Just type in uh, my name, Mark Sargent, or Flat Earth Mark probably the easiest way to to get to my things and then from there there's a whole bunch of playlists and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos interesting what kind of makes me feel like maybe we're not even physically real mm. well I, again the whole digital thoughts uh you know not to not to delve in it too much but if your listeners want to look up some interesting theories look up the uh the oldie but goodie the double slit experiment uh, which they perfected back in, I think, about 2004, maybe 2006, with a single electron gun, which basically answered the age-old question, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Now, it was something I remember you know, a teacher asking me when I was in grade school. Well, now we know the answer to it. It's like, no, it doesn't make a sound because it probably isn't even there yet. It's not drawn. Uh, and that's what the double sp slit experiment says, is that, you know, the, the world isn't built until a human being is in, in, the, in the vicinity, which I think is very, very interesting. Or if you want to look up something even weirder, something maybe even you haven't heard about, look up something called neuroscience and free will. That's a fascinating um, take. You know, that's where scientists hooked up electrodes to, you know, people's heads and had them, you know, start hitting numbers on, on computers. And they had to make a choice, like choose a number between 1 and 10. And what they realized was the computer was anticipating the brainwaves. Now, it couldn't tell you exactly what number you were going to choose. But it could tell you when you were going to choose a number, eight seconds before you chose it. Which goes into a whole other thing, which is, you know, not only are you possibly not even living in a virtual reality, you could be living in a virtual movie, like a virtual book that all the moves have already been pre-made for you. And that free will, which is why the name of the experiment is what it is, that everything, you, you set up everything before you even walked in here. So, yeah, it gets pretty weird, pretty wild. Well, how about when we look outside on a nice, you know, clear night, we can see the moon? Oh, what do you, when you go to a planetarium, and I know that dates me, I don't know when where the nearest planetarium is to you. Uh, and if people don't know what a planetarium is, it's basically like a, a small domed stadium where you take the seats and you make them go prone and you look up and they basically project the stars and the moon on the ceiling. Well, you know, if there's a moon inside that building, why, who's to say when you walk out of that building, you're just not in a much bigger planetarium. And that's what we're saying here. The stars and the sun and the moon are all just part of the giant display system, which is up there, which is basically a very, very advanced universal clock that's uh, that predates every other clock. Wow. Yeah. It makes me wonder, you know, if we're nothing more than an experiment mm -hmm. of some kid alien on, you know, in their dormitory or yeah. in their bed. 
you know, and where they're an, an ant you know, farm potentially. Yeah. yeah, you know, I've given that a lot of thoughts, and you could go you know, a couple different ways with that. And that is, you know, if if you think in the bigger universe, like what's what could be outside of this world, this building, you know, are we a box of kittens that are you know trying to be you know that are being protected from what's outside? Or are we a box of scorpions that should never, ever be let out for any reason whatsoever? Um, you know, sci-fi movies have talked about that for, for years, going all the way back to the early ones from the 50s, the, um, the, the original The Day the Earth Stood Still. Which basically, you know, the, the other civilizations came in and said, yeah, you guys aren't going anywhere. We're, we're not going to, uh, we're, we're, you guys are just far too brutal. Eh, you know, we, we've got our good and bad sides. We do seem to enjoy war, though. Oh, we love war, don't we? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe something happened. An alien race rescued a lot of the population and, and put us in a great big, well, like a zoo. Sure, sure. And we're living thinking that we're still, you know, everything's the same. Because the technology is advanced so fast, abnormally fast. Yeah. Well, in the last 20, 30 years, our technology has taken exponential leaps. And I, you, I think you may be on to something. And I, I talked about it in the book, which is it seems that for me, I think every civilization thrives on novelty. You know, what's new? That's what we, we ask everybody. You know, what's new? What's going on? And we haven't created anything new in the in the arts and entertainment world for a very very long time. I mean, I, I challenge anybody go back to movies. the the best fight the best year in movies ever was 1999, and it's never gotten any better since then. And music was capped peaked out way before then. And I don't think I think every civilization has a limited run. Because, as you know, you, you've probably done shows on this over the years. You know, there's been, there are remnants of previous civilizations. I don't think we're the first people to rent this apartment by a long shot. You know, the sunken cities of, off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Bimini Road, Puma Punku, and so on and so on. I mean, there's so many remnants of what seem to be advanced civilizations with technology equal to or greater than our own. And yet they're gone. So it feels to me kind of it's like it's kind of like a school where, you know, you, you get you get to do things. And, you know, because it can only be one of three things here. We're, we're talking it can either be a confinement like a prison. Uh, it could be entertainment or, you know, or it could be some sort of school system. Well, if it's entertainment, there's a whole bunch of people that still aren't having a lot of fun. They're not being entertained. <laughs> if it's a prison... Eh, it's a pretty nice prison. I mean, there's some beautiful places around this world. It's very, very comfortable. But it feels more like school. I think we're here to learn something. And then at the end of that duration, I think we have to move on and let some other class come in. You know, kind of like the seniors in high school. You don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. No, yeah, kind of, you know, I really feel that we've been rebooted two or three times. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, you look at that, like I mentioned last night on the show, the Finks. Yeah. They already, for years, scientists said, oh, the wear marks in the back of the things was caused by, you know, sand blowing against it. Then here recently, in the last couple of years, they, they revised it and said, no, the Finks was under the ocean. Right. And that is wear marks from the water movement and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, if that's the case, that predates it definitely before, well, me and you or any of our ancestors were walking on this planet. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and the Sphinx is brilliant. You know, I've, I've gotten a chance to see the Sphinx up close. And you look at it, and there's no doubt in my mind, there was a, there was a movie, oh, I think it was called 10,000 BC. It was done some years ago, where it, when, you, when they went by the pyramids, it was a lion. And they were talking about previous civilizations. There's no doubt that that thing was a lion and that... The pharaohs, when they came upon it, it's like, you know what? <laughs> Let's put my my head on there, you know, carve down the line. Because the, 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 the pharaoh's body or the pharaoh's head is too small for the body. And you just, who's going to know? I mean, we write the history. Most people couldn't even read and write anyway. So we can dictate, you know, through the records what's going on. And, of course, the pyramids themselves, which are, oh, my God, talk about a, an enigma. I mean, you go there and you stare at them. And you realize there isn't a single diagram, not a single hier hieroglyph that talks about how they were built. Hence the mystery, you know, who built the pyramids and how they do it. 
And it's like, no, it was there. It was in a pre it was a previous civilization that the pharaohs just inherited, claimed as their own and says, oh, yeah, we'll make a, you know, we'll make a tomb out of it. But what it was before that, well, I could be anybody's guess. Well, I can honestly tell you this. Yeah, I, I think that they were there before us because definitely at that time frame, they didn't have the technology. No. You know, like there's a company called Flow International in Kent. They're the ones that invented back, oh, I would say 30 years ago, how to cut water, you know, cut uh, stone, stone with water. Cement. Yeah, yeah, high pressure, very accurate, but not anywhere as accurate as those stones are Oh yeah, in the and so that tells you, even with our technology, we can't even duplicate anything during the pyramids. Now, the Sphinx, they figured the head is small because at one point, somebody changed the head on it. Oh, yeah. Did some recarving on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no no question. And, uh, yeah, you know, science is so, uh, again, we're, you know, we're, we're talking right now on technology that was built on the backs of science. I don't hate science. I'm not an anti-science guy. But science has a certain arrogance to them, and you know they 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 make leaps of faith that they shouldn't. It's science; they're supposed to stick to what they know, and they should be able to put question marks on things. Which is why, in the like in the original clues, I you know I tell people I, I try to give people little tidbits of information they may not have known. It's like, well, you know, we've all seen the cross sections of the Earth, right? You know, those wonderful cutaway drawings with the the red and the orange and the yellow and the white bands, you know, that white center. It's like, yeah, wow, well, where do you think they got that illustration from? And people just stopped dead in their tracks. Like, I don't know. It's like, do you know what the deepest hole ever drilled is? It's not 4,000 miles to the center of the Earth. It's not 1,000. It's not even 100. It's not even 10. It's 8 miles. That's it. 8 miles, the deepest hole ever drilled. Russians tried it, the Germans tried it, they tried to get deeper, couldn't get any deeper. So what exactly is that cross-section there? You know, the textbooks, the, the, the things we see when we're in school, there should be the earth cutaway drawing with a big question mark in the center. But science doesn't like doing that. They say, well, we've got the lab coats, we can make the decisions, and we'll just tell people. Now, in the fine print, you know, you can, you can look it up in Wikipedia, they have no idea what's down there. But it's like, well, you know, but, but the thing is, if you don't tell them that, if you don't show them the fine print, people believe what they, what they see. They see the illustrations it's like, oh yeah, that's what it looks like. It's like, no, no, they have no idea. And if they don't know any idea of this, how are you showing me cross sections of all the other planets? If you haven't even been there, oh, uh, sorry, I get worked up. <laughs> well, how about when I go out in the past when I was younger yeah. with my kids? with a telescope yeah, and we were looking at Venus, we were looking at Mars, you know, we were looking at different planets. Yeah. What were, what were, what we are you looking at? at? Just, just yeah. pretty, pretty lights. I mean, I had a guy, I got into a heated debate with, um, an astronomer from England, you know, he said, same sort of line that you, that you said, he's like, look, I've seen the moons of Jupiter, you know, with, with my telescope. And I'm going, great. I go, go to a planetarium, take your binoculars. I go, take a look at Jupiter. Does it look spherical? Yeah, it does. Can you land on it? Well, no. I go, why not? Well, because it's just a light on a ceiling. And I go, that's my point. I go, you know, it's just a light on the ceiling. Who told you that the lights in the sky were planets? Well, most of it was branches of the military. And and I don't blame them. You know, they they let science, and, they, and don't don't get me wrong, most scientists and astronomers aren't in on this. You know, they're based on, on other foundations and they didn't check and they have no way of checking, which is why, you know, when you see all the, the science, you know, especially the astrophysicists going off on black holes and quasars and gamma radiation and, and dark matter, it's like th they have no idea. They're absolutely in your, they're more popular scientists will tell you. It's like they have no idea what's going on out there. So yeah, when it comes to, sorry, short answer, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, just lights in the sky, lights on a ceiling, as a matter of fact. That's all you're looking at. Well, how about the oceans and stuff like that? Oh, like the tides? Yeah. Uh -huh. how's it, how do we keep the ocean from, you know... Oh, from falling from off? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a good one. Uh, the um, people, in fact, the, the movie Thor, you know, with Asgard and that whole cosmic waterfall thing, the, Thor did us no favors whatsoever <laughs> because because people get so hung up on space they think that it's a flat disk floating in space. No, the water can't fall off for the same reason water can't fall off in a lake. 
because you've got a shoreline all the way around. So that's basically it. The shoreline is the continent of Antarctica. And then eventually the edge of Antarctica, thousands of miles inland, you have some sort of barrier, some sort of wall that's holding the water in. Uh, you know, no, again, wh why doesn't the water fall off? Why doesn't the water fall out of a snow globe when it's sitting on a desk? Well, it's being held in by something. That's all, that's all it is. You're, you're basically living in a build. You're living on an island in the middle of a giant saltwater lake in the middle of a building. Interesting. Yeah. I, I've never looked at it that way. I mean, I look at Antarctica, yeah. you know, as melting, the sea is rising, supposedly. Yeah. But maybe, again, it's all a civilization. It's not really real. Yeah, climate, you know, it's funny because I didn't get any climate change questions for the first couple of years when I was starting to get into this. And then people started asking me it's more. It, in fact, when I do like a Q&A session, it's usually one of the first 10 questions that I get asked is, do you still like believe in climate change? And I go, well, if it's a, if it's an enclosed system, a building, then climate change takes on a whole different meaning. As a matter of fact, it makes more, way more sense because doesn't the term like greenhouse gases mean a lot more if it's an actual greenhouse? Which leads into a whole nother thing, which is um, it's one of my my five big proofs, which is um, the gravity, you know, that you're holding everything down right now versus the vacuum of space. Well. And so I don't know where you are, but let's say you have a second floor. You know, there's a floor above you and you make that second floor into a vacuum chamber. Put a cork in the ceiling. You pull the cork. What happens? Well, the, the, the air is going to rush. It's going to be instantly, by the way. It's not going to be like the movies where it's, you get a little hole and you have like five minutes fare left. It's absolutely in a fraction of a second, all gone instantly. Um, look up a wonderful series of videos on YouTube called um, Vacuum versus Steel Rail Cars where the Germans just destroy, you know, they crush rail cars like they're, they're being stomped by Godzilla. And so the question is, if the, the air rushed upstairs instantly, as soon as you pulled that cork in your ceiling, and it absolutely will, because pressure cannot exist next to an area of non-pressure, then how exactly are the clouds and everything staying where we are right now? And I know you're going to come back and say, well, because of gravity. I go, no, no, because remember I just told you what would happen if there was a vacuum chamber above you right now? You know, right above you. And you say, well, the other one's really, really, really far. Yeah, but it's really, really, really big. If you believe in, in space, space is the ultimate vacuum chamber. It's literally billions of times larger than the Earth. And it's just vacuum. So why is our atmosphere still here? It's still here because it's a pressurized system. You're, because for the same reason why the air can't get out of a snow globe. You're living in a building. Simple as that. Or a big huge globe <laughs> what's the globe gonna do the globe cannot remember what is it that the gravity of the globe cannot beat a vacuum under any circumstance whatsoever vacuum always wins vacuum is way way stronger it's it's one of the laws of thermal dynamics and by the way i, I gotta get this out there uh, and i i don't know your audience that well but gravity and you can look this up gravity is just a theory in fact, the best scientists will tell you. They're, they're not shy about telling you. They'll say, yeah, we can't tell you what gravity is, but we can tell you what it does. We can tell you the symptoms of gravity. And that's where they get kind of stuck because they can't replicate it. They, oh, yeah, sure. You can drop your pencil and it falls to the floor, whatever. But the same thing can be said of density, which is, you know, why does a, um, uh, when you take a, a basketball or a football or a beach ball or whatever, it's underneath the water. And you, you let it go from underwater, it pops back up to the surface. Why? Well, because of density. It's going the other way. Same thing could be said for heavier objects falling through the water. So yeah, it's a weird... I'm not kidding you. It's, the more everybody that starts down this road tries to disprove it. I hated Flat Earth getting into this. I was so stubborn, I, I thought I could crush it in a weekend. Nine months later, I'm sitting there going, I, I can't believe I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. Now, can I can I prove to you right now, like for example, that the um, that the uh, that the flat Earth is absolutely real? No, I cannot. But I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe, which is what everybody does, that you have nothing to turn back on except for some sort of flat model, and that's why our retention rate is so high, because I don't have to convince you of anything. I I just say, hey, prove the globe to yourself one day. Spend a little time. Don't give up. Just try to prove the globe. And you'll, you'll end up chipping away at it slowly but surely. And then one day, all of a sudden, it's like there's nothing left. So, yeah.
weird. That way, I kind of lean that we're nothing more than a computer symbolization. Oh yeah, I, I just feel that because it, it makes more logical. Oh no, I, I absolutely agree. But 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 to your point, and I don't know, um, what, like if you play any games, but every computer simulation that we've made, with the exception of like very very few, I mean, there's some uh, less than one percent. We'll just say ninety nine percent of all computer simulations made are made perfectly flat. And I don't care what video game you're playing, whether it's Fortnite or Grand Theft Auto or Minecraft or any of those things, Warcraft, they're all flat. They're made on a perfectly flat square. It's, it might as well be a giant cracker. Um, the reason is, is because it's easier to program, right? Pro to program. Uh, most developers, software programmers are lazy just by nature. And so if the person that's playing the game, whether it's say Fortnite or GTA or whatever, if they don't notice... If they can't tell that there isn't a curve, then you don't build one. You don't build one in. And so, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, every every simulation I ever had to deal with when you know remember, I started out playing video games for a living, there's, um, in fact, it's not even, we don't even, when we build simulations, we don't build them in the shape of a snow globe. We build them in a box because computers hate, hate curves. <laughs> they hate, um, uh, computers can't draw circles, for example. Most people don't know that it's it's all it's why pixels are square. Tell tell a computer how to how to draw a circle. We can draw a circle. It's instinctive. It's in us. But a computer can only draw right angles. Now they can be really 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 tiny right angles, so it appears that it's drawing a circle. But when you zoom in on it, you know, like the old days, it's why you know like the old video games were like really really blocky, like the um, the Atari twenty six hundreds. But yeah, everything's in a giant box. Interesting. One of the listeners out there has a question and the question is do you think we actually ever been to the moon no good lord no that's a great question uh because you have to start there and i don't want to pick huh, on american patriotism or anything like that because we're, we're all brought up in this country to you know to rah rah wave the flag go team um and the Amer america's greatest we went to the moon nobody else went to the moon um, no, no, the Apollo program, everything, Mercury, Gemini, Gemini Apollo, Voyager, all that, all those programs. Um, as a matter of fact, you could look up, and you don't even have to look very hard. Um, I'll, I'll give you some just quick bullet points on what you aren't seeing when it comes to the moon. So look at any, like, Apollo photo, you know, everything from 11 all the way through 17. Um, look at things like shadows intersecting. Um, shadows only go one direction. One light source, shadows only go in one direction, unless... That light source is really, really close. Remember, the sun's 93 million miles away. The, you know, you go outside, all the shadows are in one direction uh, on a summer day. Um, no blast crater underneath the, the capsule. You know, that thing has 10,000 pounds of thrust. And it was landing on ash, <laughs> like some really fine powdery ash. And none of that ash is out of place at all. There's no splay pattern anywhere. You know, you could you light a Fourth of July rocket on your driveway. That splay pattern is going to be there for three months. Uh, Ten thousand pounds of, of thrust, and there's nothing. There's nothing there. Um, how about a little engineering? How about um, the the VHF transmitter that was sitting there? You know, the little little satellite dish. I mean, you can look it up. It's not secret technology. That's a VHF transmitter from uh, 1969. It's got a range on a good day, on a good day of 50 miles, maybe. And even then, you're transmitting Morse code. And this thing was doing uh, 250,000 miles through the Van Allen belts with 10 frames per second video, color, and audio two-way communication with pinpoint accuracy. I, I, I couldn't do this. We can do this now. Could not do this. Um, but the biggest one for me for Apollo, and it's not just Apollo, but anything, anything that you see a spacesuit, um, and I challenge anybody, you can email me and, and send me the specs on this. Tell me how a spacesuit works. And you're saying, what are you talking about? I'm going, well, I, I don't care about the oxygen levels and the carbon dioxide levels and the nitrogen or heating or cooling. Tell me how a spacesuit, what technology stops the vacuum of space? Meaning thermal dynamics says that pressure must have a container. And if it's a soft container, it absolutely will go rigid. It will, it will turn into a balloon and then it'll eventually burst. You can watch videos all day long. You put a football, a basketball, he, a stretch Armstrong, put anything in a vacuum, a soda can, put anything in a vacuum chamber, it will burst before it reaches 100% vacuum. And yet, 
these astronauts were walking around, could move their arm, their elbows and knees perfectly fine. They had all their articulation points, manipulate their fingers perfectly. Those things should have been as useless as oven mitts up there and never, ever saw any of that. It was amazing what you, what you can get away with if you pass it off on TV. It's like, well, it's on the news. It has to be real. It has to be real. No one would ever, would ever fake something like that. Or I got one more for you. Um, show me an audio, send me an audio recording of an astronaut in any mission whatsoever telling you or mentioning how many minutes of air they have left. That it's something just blew by everybody, which was, including me for at least two and a half years when I was looking into this, which is like, if you, you know, scuba divers, probably people that have scuba dived, all you care about when you're scuba diving is one thing, the time on your watch, how much air you have left, your oxygen, nitrogen mixture. It's all you care about how many minutes you have left, because eventually when you reach a certain point, you're going back in, you're going back up to the surface. The astronauts did not care ever. They had this magical unlimited air supply that they never, ever cared about. Nothing. They never check their spacesuits, and we're talking analog technology. I mean, if you want to tell me that you know they might have this, and you know now in 2020, if maybe if you know, maybe you might be able to convince me. But in 1969, we didn't even have Duracell batteries back then. So <laughs> yeah, how, how the hell did they pull that stuff up? So sorry, short. I know I was ranting there, but that's yeah, the the moon mission. I'm sorry. It's just it 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 has not aged well over the years has not well a lot of people theorize it was shot in a studio oh god yes yeah 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 i mean it was well it, here, here's one more for you well on top of you know there's no stars ever and i know they'll say well you know because you know the exposure settings it's like okay since everybody says that they would have known this and they would have taken at least one roll of film with the correct exposure settings it would have been gorgeous and we never, we never ever saw it. Yeah, it was shot in some studio, probably some Air Force base, off in the desert somewhere. And it just never, I mean, come on, we, we weren't the ones that brought, I mean, people have been, people have been criticizing the moon program since, ever since they quit. <laughs> By 1980, there were already people, but there was no internet to share anything. Social media has really changed the game. Anyway, sorry, what else we got? Well, you know what? It's time for us to go to break, and this break is about eight minutes, so that gives you time to stretch, you know, have some java, a cup of tea, or whatever. Okay. And be back with Mark uh, uh, Sargent and talking about the flat earth. So stay tuned. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio. Check out our website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. We will be back in about eight minutes. Coming to you from some far point station, like a cosmic tumbleweed, both north and south of the Pleiades, here's your host, Gary Anderson. And that is me. We're back with Mark Sargent. We're talking flat earth. How many people out there, Mark, are starting to believe the world is flat? Oh, millions. We've had them for a number of years now. Um, and we skew younger. So... I didn't realize how big it was until the u.gov survey came out in 2017. So it was this British scientific research group that had nothing to do with us. They hate us, as a matter of fact. And they did a poll of 10,000 Americans. I wanted to find out how many people were getting involved in Flat Earth. And it was skewing anywhere from 4 to 6% uh you know in the older groups but when what really caught their eye was the 18 to 24 year olds and remember this was three years ago uh the 18 to 24 year olds a full third you know i think 33 34 percent were skeptics of the whole globe thing and below 18 they, they're not even allowed to talk to and we've looked at some informal straw polls you know stuff that we didn't have to, anything to do with and we're skewing 50 something percent However, that, so yeah, so, you know, there's a whole bunch of kids that are getting involved, but peer pressure is really, really strong. So 90% of our members are in the closet. So it's this weird paradox. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are in it, but the ones that will admit it publicly aren't, they aren't as much as they could be because they're mostly afraid of coworkers. I mean, sometimes friends and family, but mostly coworkers. 
but I, I've talked to some heavy hitters out there and it's amazing. I mean, it's the reason, the, the big reason why it's resonating as well as it is, is because it's now easier to explain than the globe, the solar system model. It's way easier. The, the, the snow globe model is way, way easier to explain because the, the, the solar system model needs a whole bunch of math that you know you and I and everybody else n never studied which would you know geometry and trigonometry and calculus and quantum mechanics and stuff like that whereas the planetarium Truman show snow globe building does really needs almost nothing you know some basic algebra maybe a little bit of geometry but that's about it and so yeah we're we're huge I mean we the amount of stuff we we've done I mean last year we did conferences in dallas canada uh i did one in stockholm uk new zealand did a commercial in australia uh and not and we made the cover of newsweek popular science and skeptic and just about every other group has talked to us you know national geographic hates us uh but yeah we're, we're huge we're monstrous right now when did the flat earth start the whole talk about flat earth the the most recent version of it uh started in 2015. uh i mean it was kind of kind of the, the it started a little bit in 2014. before that it was like the old school so if you treat it like software uh flat earth 2.0 started in 2015. And it started off pretty pretty slow, and I I have something to do with it, you know, where I made basically the dummy's guide to flat Earth, and I know that sounds redundant, but it's true. I mean, I made a version, basically Flat Earth 101, a very very easy way to understand it, called Flat Earth Clues, and then um, uh, a, a musical artist and Neil deGrasse Tyson got into a huge online debate about it in 2016, and then Kyrie Irving, you know, the NBA came out about in 2017 uh, and then you know more and more sports guys and celebrities started talking about it uh, and then the media just you know it just kept it, the snowball just kept getting bigger and bigger to where we had um jimmy kimmel uh punk us down when we were doing the dallas i mean he asked us if he could come you know his his team could come to the dallas conference which was just in november and then he, he, he turned it into a nine minute skit part of his monologue and that just happened heck we were we we got a mention in the um the Super Bowl last week at the um during the um if you haven't looked it up uh what if you watch the Amazon commercial that whole thing where they said oh yeah the Earth is flat that's that's absolutely us you know uh, the reason why Amazon chose that and other things is because we just keep trending we we don't go away. Well, do you get ridiculed? You know. Oh by... yeah. Of course. I mean, in fact, if you don't, it's it's something I put in the book, which is if you don't make fun of Flat Earth in the first five, ten minutes, then there's probably something wrong with you. Because the conditioning that you've gotten since you were a kid, you know, when, you know, because you've seen the globe so many times, of course you're going to defend it. You got to remember that for a lot of us, like in the corner of our classrooms, at least in the States, you know, we have the, the American flag in most classrooms and then below that you have the globe well the american flag you know if you watch that for 12 years there's people that go right out of high school into the military and part of it is because they see the flag every day you know say the pledge of allegiance and you know pay tribute well what's the difference between the american flag and the globe they're right next to each other a lot of people are, are willing to defend it so yeah i have members of my own family that uh you know on both sides of the fence which is interesting like i my sister hates it absolutely hates it but i have cousins that are really into it who will not come out it's like yeah i'm not going to be going to the meetups and i'm not going to be doing anything because the, you know they're afraid of what might happen at work so yeah i i don't mind though and and when people come at me they say you know why don't you get mad you know when people come at you and yell and scream and stuff and i say why would i get mad i used to be them not you know back in 2015 i was them i was the one i mean seriously i looked at flat earth and and so this is the stupidest thing i've ever heard Everybody knows flat earth is ridiculous, but that's just it. You don't know why it's ridiculous. You just know it's ridiculous. It's, it's just burned into your head. And then when you start looking into it, you, it's, it's so strange. You start staring at it and the more you stare at it, the worse it gets, which is why the, the first chapter of the book, uh, that I just put out this, my second book, um, flat earth clues into the world. The first chapter is literally called look away and it's not reverse psychology. 
And he's like, look, if you like the, your life the way it is, if you wake up and everything is awesome, thumbs up, you know, go team, then don't even bother. Don't even bother looking at it because it is a rabbit hole that there's no, you don't come back from it. It's, um, it's the red pill, blue pill thing. Once you go into it, because you're the one that, you know, you're the one that had to convince yourself. I'm not here to convince you or persuade you. You convinced yourself. That's how most of the members, the, the, the t-shirt reads, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. The, the t-shirt reads, literally, I became a flat earther because I tried to disprove it. And nobody, nobody loves it. They, they'll hate it. But when you stare at something long enough, it's like, oh man, it can't be. I mean, I almost broke a keyboard back in 2015. So there you go. So we're in a big box. We're, it, it, our, our whole civilization. Yeah. And it tells me that something had to create that box and put us in it. That is, that is the big overarching question, which is uh, if, and, and it, you're absolutely right, which is if, if it is a box, then it is an organic in any way, shape or form, then it was built. And if it was built, well, then that changes things, doesn't it? Because if it was built, that means that, which is why ha at least half of our community, I'm not, I'm at least 50% are hardcore Christians. Uh, because if it was built, well, then it was built by somebody. And at that point, religious, religion does come into play. Because it, again, either it's an advanced civilization that's older and powerful, or it's the divine. And at that point, you're really just splitting hairs because one man's advanced tech is another man's deity. So, yeah, yeah. At that point, do you, which is, I, I talked about this in the clues because it was kind of a spiritual journey, which is if we this place was built and it's possible that somebody is actually looking over your shoulder, do you still do the things you're doing now? And, and if you think that's a stretch, it's like, well, okay, well, we, we've all been seeing the, um, the cameras at stoplights, right? At, at intersections. And it's like, you know, you'll, you everyone's run a red light, but you won't run a red light when there's a camera there. Why? Well, because there's a camera there. It might get caught. Why are you thinking about it in the first place? <laughs> right? And that's, that's really what we're talking about here. I mean, I won't, I mean, it's, it may sound kind of cheesy, but I won't do anything malicious to anybody ever again. Because I've got a really, really strong feeling now, way stronger than I used to. And I was raised born again Christian. I mean, I fell away from the church for years, but now it's like, oh no, if this place was built, that means we're, we're under the microscope. Now, you know, what are the, exactly the rules? Well, it depends on what your faith is, but yeah, yeah, it was built. Well, how about aliens visiting the planet and and abducting people and people disappearing and all that stuff. Uh, oh, no, I think it's real. I don't think there's any conflict there at all. Um, as a matter of fact, um, that was one of the first questions that people came at me with was, you know, do you still believe in aliens? I go, well, I do, but I don't think they're from Mars and Jupiter and Venus and, and places like that where we immediately assume they're from. Um, I think they're just older versions of ourselves. I think they're previous civilizations that are not allowed to engage directly you know, the old question, which is why haven't aliens landed in Main Street, USA, you know, come out, taken a few selfies and signed some autographs and, and, and because they would have influenced too many things. And we saw what happened with Roswell. I mean, the media started, you know, ramping up like a turbine engine and it was going to get ugly in a hurry. So, you know, but I think there's rules. I don't think I, so I do, I think there's things out there with, with ships. Yeah, you bet. You want to have some fun buy some night vision binoculars, you don't, you know, generation one, you don't have to get two or three and start looking at the sky and tell me what you see. I mean, the, the sky's crawling with things. And I think they're just old versions of us. I think they're the, the, the elder, the upperclassmen that aren't allowed to do anything. Yeah, of course you can pick off a few people in a boat or a forest or a mountain, stuff like that. I mean, the abductions are always in, in remote places. Nobody's getting grabbed off of main street. Uh, but I think they're out there. Sure. Sure, why not? And what they look like, phew, you know, what do previous civilizations look like? And the sky's the limit there. Yeah, well, that's where a computer symbolization, you know, and yeah. and it was nothing more than a on a you know program running on computer chips. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you when you get to it, I mean, it's something. It's 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 funny because it's something we've been striving for for years in the entertainment industry. I mean, we're, that's all we care about at the highest level of this entertainment is creating that, that very thing. 
In fact, it was funny. Um, do you remember the the comic strip Dilbert? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the creator of Dilbert, smart guy, he um he wrote the forward to this book, and I read it. And I thought it was really interesting. He goes, you know, he goes, the last invention we'll ever make was it will be the holodeck. And of course, the only thing he had to go off was, you know, the, the Star Trek Next Generation holodeck, you know, basically a holographic simulation, because he said once that's built, no one's going to care about anything else. All they're going to care about is is the bare minimum they need to do so they can spend the most time they can in the holodeck. And that's what we're talking about here. You know, if we can envision it, if we can envision a virtual reality, then it's probably already happened. You know, and, and the, we're probably already in it. That's that's the catch, which which is also, by the way, why I don't think we'll be allowed to fully build it ourselves, because once we build it, then the world that we're in becomes completely irrelevant. And I, I don't think that's how it works. I think it's 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 a catch there where we're, we're, we won't be able to to close that loop. But yeah, yeah, I have I have little doubt that we're, we're in it. I mean, seriously, look at anyone's out there. Look up the double slit experiment. And, uh, and email me and I'll tell you exactly what it means. I mean, it's something we, uh, how many minutes do we have left? We're coming down on this, right? Yeah, we got a few, but I, I want to say something. What? We actually have those holograms come a long ways in the, in the you know, in the entertainment industry. Oh yeah. yeah. They, they have, you know, putting on shows now with Elvis Presley and a few other famous, you know, singers that are no longer with us. Yeah. And, and it looks like they're actually on stage. The people in the audience, they're looking at it, and they actually see the person there. Oh, yeah. I mean, the technology is getting to the point. It's scary. The The goal that they want to do isn't exactly the, the holographic technology. What they want to do is figure out the frequency for the human brain, like a radio frequency or television frequency. Um, that's what they really want to do. And, and they want to do it without cr creating some sort of health risk because, you know, everything that we sense, it's all electrochemical, uh, and you know, it's basically electricity and they, they've been trying to crack that code for a number of years. If they ever do it, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be some ethical issues involved, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a brave new world that's coming. And, uh, I believe that 2020 has got, uh, a lot of potential written on it. I believe in literal things, and I think 2020, you know, that whole 2020 20 vision, 2020 hindsight, I think it's going to uh, potentially be a, 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 a real benchmark year for a lot of different things. I just got a weird spidey sense about it. So what do you think that our future as humans are, either on this brown planet or in a box? Oh, I, I think eventually we're going to have a revelation um, that... You know, some other civilization is going to get involved here, whether it be one of the older ones. I, and and it, I know it sounds like science fiction, but at the same time, come on, we, we've been writing science fiction now for so long that any age group has a reference to it. And a, a lot of weird, weird stuff has been happening. So I think there's it's going to be a revelation. I think that we our civilization has now reached a tipping point where it's this big crossroads, which is potentially a new golden age. Or, uh, you know, the other side, you know, which could be uh, apocalyptic in nature. I hope it's not apocalyptic. I'd love to, I'd love to see, uh, you know, a happy ending to this uh, story because that's what I think we're in. I think we're in a giant story, a giant book. And uh, we're and act three is upon us right now. You know, all great stories, three acts. Um, first act, establish the characters. Second act, give them a challenge. Third act, resolve it one way or the other. Well, maybe the, the guy who originally wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was right. Maybe our planet was in the way for the <laughs> superhighway. So they took all, our, all the living beings on our planet and put them into a box and then, you know, hit the button and Earth was gone. Yeah, maybe. I, I loved, you know, I even loved the remake. I, I watched the television series when I was younger. And uh, the movie, I thought, I thought they did a nice, nice job with it. But yeah, yeah. I mean, think of it this way. Let me, let me end it with this. We've written so much science fiction over the years. We've met, you know, so much fantasy and science fiction. We've covered basically every, every conceptual reality option that you can, you can think of. You know, we've got movie references for just about everything. 
I treat them just like lottery tickets. Isn't it likely that one of those was going to be right since we covered all of them? You know, one of these was going to happen, whether it be some weird alien race showing up or some sort of plague or some sort of, you know, bad or good. Some, we've already thought about it. You know, we've already come up with the options. It's just a question of which one, uh, which one is going to be chosen. Yeah. Well, maybe the plague is starting to hit now. Might nah, be the end of the- nah, nah, nah. That, that thing, the, the the coronavirus, nah, 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 nah. If, if that thing was as bad as they said, like, if you want to have any doubts, watch the movie, which I just watched again recently, Contagion, uh, which is, if things get really, really bad, you know, because they start interrupting programming for that sort of stuff. You, you'll actually get the emergency broadcast system start kicking in. And they're not even remotely close. I mean, all the airports are open. If, if things get, get really, really bad, I mean, look at, um, just reference the movie, the the old Stephen King book, um, oh, The Stand, <laughs> about a military virus that got out. And I mean, you, you'd know. It's, there's, there's no sense of urgency out there. I do a lot of traveling. It's, it's just not there. Okay. Well, I hope you are right because, you know, as the Center of Disease announced the other the other day that they now are, you know, going to put it as a major, major thing now. Eh, I don't know. I, I, I just not seen it yet. I mean, if it's going to spread, it's going to spread very, very quickly. And we just haven't seen the cases. The thing, here, Here's the difference. I know we're running out of time. Is social media is so integrated now that people would be talking about it. And that was the thing with Contagion. And that was people were sending each other messages so fast, like, oh yeah, this guy just dropped flat. Oh, hey, I have family members here. I've seen no chatter. You know, the old military saying, I've I've heard no chatter about this at all, with the exception of what's on CNN. I, I think it's just another scare tactic that the news is putting out there. It's like, oh, it's a scary world. You need us. It's like, all right, I, I see what you're doing. Well, it keeps our mind off of Washington, D.C. Well, yeah, but now, you know, not not to get into politics, but the impeachment's over. Go figure. So now what's going to happen? I mean, it's February. It's the beginning of February. What are you going to do for the next 10 months? <laughs> it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, again, where, uh, where can they find your book? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the book's on Amazon. Uh, you can look. All you have to do is type in Flat Earth Clues on Amazon. You'll find it. Uh, the first book was called Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's the Limit. The second one was called uh, Flat Earth Clues, End of the World, because um, National Geographic thought that, that Flat Earth could bring about the new Dark Ages. And uh, there's an audio version. There's a Kindle version and an audio version. If you don't like, if you like just listening to it, uh, you, can, you can get the audio version on Audibles. Uh, easy, easy to find. Interesting. And do you have a Facebook page where people can find you? I don't. Uh, I, I'm one of those guys that, uh, I mean, social media, I'm only going to go so far because you can get stretched really, really thin. Um, the only social media stuff that I really do is on YouTube. Um, and my YouTube channel is literally called Mark Sargent. And again, you can just type in Flat Earth Mark and you'll find it. Uh, all the Any other social media that's out there that may have my name on it isn't run by me. But that's okay. I mean, as long as you listen to the clues, I don't care whose channel it's on. I mean, I've had people mirror my stuff everywhere. I don't, um, I've never thrown a copyright strike. It's just, yeah, have, 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 have at it. I think the, the truth should be free for the most part. Interesting. So where do you think the near future is going to go with the Flat Earth movement? Wow. Um, every time I try to make a prediction in the Flat Earth, uh, I get blown away by underestimating it. I mean, last year I didn't think that we would be, we would do nearly the national things that we did, or international. I didn't think we were going to have conferences in as many countries as we did, and I didn't think I'd be, um, I didn't think I'd do a commercial. So, uh, considering we we got that mention in the Super Bowl last week, I don't, um, I think it's just going to grow by leaps and bounds. I'm what I'm hoping this year is that a reality television show finally happens where we get a lot more high profile and uh, some big celebrities, you know, other than the ones we've already seen, talk about it more. Uh, but other than that, I don't know what, what other predictions I can make because I've, I've been kind of, I was kind of blindsided in 2019. So all I can tell you is, look, it's not going away. Everybody's been telling me since 2015, it's like, oh, you know, 15 minutes of fame is going, really? Because it's five years now. <laughs> and and I just keep getting busier. So whatever you think it's going to end, let me know. I'd, I'd love oh, to hear yeah. it. 
Well, sir, I just want to thank you for coming on Night Dreams Talk Radio. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, you know, anytime you need me, just call me up. I will. And if you get any good news or anything you want to share, you know how to get a hold of me for the email. Get a hold of me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, my friend. Have a great week. All right. You too. Okay, Mark. Bye-bye. Take care. Well, that was an interesting conversation. Is the worth?